Okay, there are the grade boundaries. My wife made me change my shirt for a more respectful one. I bought a better microphone so you can hear me properly without the I had a shave. I don't to set these things up so it won't do that. Uh, I'm banished to the cold room. I've got my hot water bottle. I've got my cup of tea to keep me warm. And instead of looking at myself, I'm looking at the arrow I put over the camera. We're all ready for higher level. Okay, pH3 phosphine. I seem to remember that spontaneously catches fire in air. All right, let's draw that out. So phosphorus is in group 15 with five valence electrons and hydrogen is in group one. So I'm gonna do five plus one plus one plus one. I want pairs, so that gives me four pairs of valence electrons. First atom probably goes into the, uh, probably goes into the center of the molecule. Spread the others evenly around. Join them up. No triangles, almost certainly no triangles. Uh, so I've dealt with three electron pairs. I've got one more to deal with to make four. So I pop that on the phosphorus to make a stable octet, one point. Hybridization, well, uh, anything that's sp3 is mostly single bonds. sp2 is gonna have double bonds and sp is gonna have triple bonds. So that looks like sp3 to me. Yep. Is it a Lewis acid or a base? Well, uh, a Lewis acid can receive a pair of electrons and a Lewis base can donate a pair of electrons. I don't necessarily agree with the IB answer here, but their answer is it's a Lewis base because it can donate this pair of electrons. That I agree with. That's the, that's the point that they want. Come on. But I also know that phosphorus can have an expanded octet. It can have 10 electrons like pH 5. So I think it could also gain a pair of electrons. But the IB answer is it's a base, it can donate. Getting too clever with my boots there, Thornley. Next one. Do I expect the, bon the bonds in phosphine to be polar or non-polar? Uh -huh. Well, let's look at the electronegativity. Uh, there was a comment that uh, a lot of people gave it for the molecule instead of the bonds. Well, let's look at it for the bonds. So fluorine has the highest electronegativity. Uh, that attracts electrons in bonds more than any other element. But phosphorus has an electronegativity of 2.2 and hydrogen's 2.2. So the bonds are nonpolar. So bond polarity, does it want to know why? Outline, yeah. So they have the same electronegativity. So it's going to be nonpolar. Is that enough? Probably. Nonpolar, and they had the same electronegativity. Fantastic. You could accept similar. Well, they look the same in the IB table. Phosphine has a greater molar mass than ammonia. So basically, why is phosphine a gas? It's an annoying paint color. And ammonia is a liquid. Well, it has to be to do with intermolecular forces, doesn't it? So this phosphine must have weaker intermolecular forces. And since the bonds are nonpolar, the molecules nonpolar, so that's going to have to be London dispersion forces. Ammonia, well, that has to have stronger intermolecular forces, and that's going to be hydrogen bonds. So that has the stronger intermolecular force, hydrogen bonds. Don't make the relatively foreseeable mistake of thinking that these are hydrogen bonds. These are not. These are covalent bonds. Hydrogen bonds are an intermolecular force. They occur between one molecule and the next. So that would be the little, uh, ne the little negative, the delta negative of the nitrogen and the delta positive of the hydrogen on the next molecule. There's your, London, uh, there's your hydrogen bond there. Okay. London dispersion, hydrogen bonds, smashing. All right then. Next up, ammonia acts as a weak Bronsted Lowry base when dissolved in water. What's meant by weak? So weak means uh, it's partially dissociated. And maybe only one in a thousand of the uh, ammonia molecules grab that proton. Partially dissociated. Are there two S's in dissociated? There are. 
partially dissociated. And it's a Bronsted Lowry base because it's a, a proton receiver. Acid to proton donor. Is that enough? Yeah. What's the difference between 4P and P4? Okay. Hmm. So be careful about the use of atoms and molecules here. So P4, well, that's a molecule. It's two or more atoms chemically bonded together. And 4P is actually four phosphorus atoms individually and unbonded. Is that enough? P4 is a molecule. And 4P is four separate atoms. Yeah. Okay, next one. This seems quite straightforward so far. Expecting a kick in the teeth soon. Amphiprotic. So amphoteric is where a substance can act as either an acid or a base. But amphiprotic is where a substance can act as either a bronsted Lowry acid or a bronsted Lowry base. So that means amphiprotic means uh, the substance can donate or receive a proton. Done. What the hell's that? Donate or receive a proton. Oh, and show some equations. So if I'm adding a proton, that's going to be H3PO4, PO2, cheeky. And if I'm removing a proton, that's going to be H. PO2 2 minus. Is that right? Yeah, let's check. I'm pretty sure that's right. The oxidation state of phosphorus. Well, all uh, elements have an oxidation state of zero. P4 is an element. But isn't it four? No, 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 no. It's still an element. It's just one pure type of atom on the periodic table. Hydrogen is plus one in a compound, and oxygen is minus two in a compound. It all equals the charge on the iron, which is that. So what's that going to give me? Is that going to give me... Uh, and as usual, uh, if you just put one, that's wrong. Fair enough. And if you put one plus, that's wrong. One plus is the charge, not the oxidation state. Mm -hmm. All right, so you could claim uh, that this is oxidation because you're adding oxygen. So adding oxygen is indeed oxidation. With the definition to do with oxygen and hydrogen. But oxidation states, <coughs> excuse me, I've gone from zero to plus one. And so now that is also oxidation. The oxidation number increases, that's oxidation. So what's the question? Explore for three points. So adding oxygen. Ah, clever. I'm also adding hydrogen. Ah, that's kind of clever. So I'm also adding hydrogen. So for the first definition, I'm adding oxygen, I'm adding hydrogen. What am I doing? It's confusing. Ah, but using oxidation states gives me plus one. Oh, that's kind of nice. I kind of like that one. Is that the answer? Mm -mm -mm. Oxygen gain, covered oxidation, hydrogen gain, reduction, negative. Ah, nice. I've not seen that question before. That seems... All right, white phosphorus, that's terrible stuff. You're not allowed to shoot it at people in war. Uh, you can use it to illuminate the battlefield. So, of course, uh, they shoot it at people in war and then say, oh, I'm just illuminating the battlefield. That's a problem if you get caught doing it in the day, and several armies have been. Calculate the amount of white phosphorus used. All right. So are they giving me any numbers? 2.478 grams of white phosphorus. 
2.478 grams. Four sig figs. Oh, you're killing me. Let's see what the molar mass of phosphorus is. Is that about 31? 30.97. So four times 30.97. Let's do the calculation. So zero, oh, that's a nice number, 0 0.02, okay. So that gives me 0 0.02. Let's keep those sig figs, four sig figs. Is that right? Yep. So for the sodium hydroxide, running out of space a bit here. So let's do the sodium hydroxide there. So moles is concentration times volume. So my moles is going to be my concentration times the volume. They've given me the concentration is 5.00 and the volume uh, I'm going to do the 100 centimeters cubed divided by 1,000, I need decimeters cubed. So that's going to give me 0 0.100. More zeros, another zero. Okay, I can do that in my head. That's 0 0.5 moles. It seems big. Let me check that out. Uh, yeah, that does seem really rather big. So the ratio is, uh, but that's the answer. So I've got one P4 every three hydroxides. So it seems clear that the P4 is going to run out. There's only 0 0.02 of those compared to 0.5 of the hydroxides. So it's excess or limiting. So the limiting is going to be uh, P4. Now, how would you show that? It's obvious from the numbers. So what you have to do is you have to do the, uh, well, you're going to say P4 uh, to OH minus. Let's have a look. So I've got uh, the moles over the coefficient for the P4, and then I've got uh, the moles over the coefficient for the OH minus. Which of those is smaller? Well, clearly the phosphorus is smaller. And if the phosphorus is smaller, then that, uh, that relationship shows that the phosphorus is indeed the limiting one. I didn't need that faffing about, you could have just done the moles. Determine the excess amount in moles of the other reagent. Okay, let me tidy this up a little bit. So I've got 0 0.5 there. So the way I do this, uh, let me clear a bit of space. is uh, I know that this is the excess reagent. We just did that calculation. So I put excess, and the big X means it's wrong. So really, 1 is to 0 0.02, as to 3 is to 0 0.06. So I really needed 0 0.06, but they gave me 0 0.5. So how much extra moles did they give me? Well, it's going to be 0 0.5 minus the 0 0.06 that I actually needed, which is going to give me uh, 0 0.44 moles. Yeah, okay. What's the volume of phosphine measured in centimeters cubed at standard temperature and pressure? 
So the volume of phosphine, well, I, best, I, I guess I better work out how many moles of phosphine I've got. So it's, it's one to one. So I've got this, that's also going to be 0 0.02000. Zero, 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 zero. All right? It's a one to one ratio between the P4 and the phosphine. So I've got uh, 0 0.02000 zero, 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 zero moles. I've got moles, I've got volume, isn't that going to be PV equals NRT? Isn't that what's going to be happening here? Must be, mustn't it? So I've got a PV equals NRT. You want to know the volume, so that's going to be NRT over V, over P, excuse me. So N is the number of moles, which is going to be 0 0.02000. The gas constant, it's in the data booklet, if you can't remember it. There it is, 8.31. 8.31. The temperature, well that's got to be in Kelvin. It says standard temperature and pressure. If you can't remember what that is, you can also look it up. That's 273 Kelvin. And the pressure is 100. Let me work that out. Uh, so that's in decimeters cubed. So then in centimeters cubed, I just have to multiply by 1,000. So that's 453.7. So I reckon that's going to be uh, 453.7 centimeters cubed. 454. Come on. Other methods, da-da-da-da-da. Uh, P is either. What are you joking? Oh, no, no. So I wonder if I forgot to do the sig figs. I, I messed up the sig figs there. So it's actually three sig figs, isn't it? Look at that. And I did four. So that would be 454. It doesn't mention if you lose a point for sig figs there. So I think if it doesn't mention it, you can get away with it. Next up, 1DI. Okay, this looks like a, an attempt to do like an exotic Q equals MC delta T, doesn't it? If you've got specific heat capacity. So Q equals MC delta T. Do they want it with moles or anything? Uh, well, we can sort that out. So I know M is the mass of what's heated, which is going to be uh, 200.0 grams of air. C is a specific heat capacity of what's heated, which is rather delightfully just one. Temperature change is what we need. That's the question. So Q. Okay, so tricks they play. I'm messing you around with the uh, with the specific heat capacity and the units for mass. So the specific heat capacity is in kilojoules uh, kilojoules per kilogram per kelvin. So then I've got to make sure that my uh, my mass is also in kilograms, or it isn't going to work. So now I've got delta T equals Q over MC, which equals 750. Over 0.2 times 1, which is, 
Let's have a look. That's bonkers. I also think that I'm locked into two sig figs. I'm locked into two sig figs by the 750. There's no dot there. So I think that would be uh, 3,800 Kelvin. That's so hot, that would, that would rip everything apart. Not many chemical bonds can withstand that. Ah, oh, they say, they say 3750. 3750. So they want that answer. Not that answer. But they're locked into two sig figs. I'm, I'm not spacing out. Yeah, it's two sig figs on the 750. I think that's wrong. I know that's wrong. Oh, well. That's a pity no one picks these things up on the way through. Especially if, when they grade a whole bunch of papers before they produce the model answers. All right, next one. The oxide formed in the reaction of air contains. Okay, this simple empirical formula. So I've got P, I've got O. I know that O is 16, and I know that P is 31 for the molar mass. At the top, put the percentage or the mass involved. So I've got uh, 43.6. I'd be chemistry teacher's wife. Yeah. Trying to record something here. I can just hear you. Doing coochie coo to babies in Arabic. All right, and so over here it's going to be 100 minus 43.6. I've used integer molar masses, I'm sure we'll get away with it. So, uh 43.6 divided by 31 is, uh, so that's 1.4. 56.4, isn't that what it is? 56.4 divided by 16 is 3.5. Okay. So I've got P 1.4. Oh, 3.5, divide by the smallest, is that going to work? Divide by the smallest, to give P1, just divide that by, so P1, O2.5, so is that going to give me P2, O5? If I double everything again, oh, that's nice. It's got a few little tricks in it. I like that. So the molecular formula has a molar mass of 285. So let me check the molar mass of my uh, P205 empirical formula. Uh, let's see if they're the same or not. So I've got 5 times 16, which is 80. And then I've got uh, 2 times 31, which is 62. So that's going to give me 142. Okay. So it looks like my empirical formula has half the molar mass of the molecular formula. So really, it's going to be P4010. Yeah, that's only worth one point. But if you had to show how you got that point, you'd then do 285 divided by 142 is 2. And there we go. But it's only worth one point. You just want the answer. Poorly answered the next one. An equation for the reaction of the phosphorus with water. Oh, there's like 1% of this syllabus I'm never going to remember. It's, it's this bit, it's part of it. I just remember it makes phosphoric acid, or is it phosphoric and phosphorus acid? But anyway, let's, let's see what we can do. P4O10 plus water. I'm sure it makes phosphoric acid. So that's H3PO4. Let's see what's left over. So I'm going to need 4 here to balance the phosphorus. Uh, to balance the hydrogen, I've got 12, I'm going to need 6 there. Oh, there's a whole bunch of oxygen left over. Does it bubble out oxygen? That doesn't seem right. I've got 16 oxygen here. And on this side, I've got, oh yeah, that's it. Oh, it's just phosphoric acid. 
that right? Nice. Oh, do they want state symbols? <coughs> no. Okay. Oh, Thorny's on top of it. A challenge in the worst answered one. I've not looked at the answer yet. But for most of these, I don't look at the answers. Suggests why it's not a major contributor to acid deposition. Uh, well, it is an acid. It reacts uh, with water to make phosphoric acid, which is, uh, well, it's actually a medium acid, but in IB we pretend it's a strong acid. But the thing is, there's no, uh, phosphorus isn't produced from the combustion of fossil fuels. Now, you get nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxides, but not phosphorus oxides. I think that's the answer. Phosphorus is not commonly found in fuels. I do have a degree in environmental chemistry. <laughs> they laughed. Turns out that's quite important now. All right then. Pre-combustion and post-combustion. Sometimes they've asked this for three points. Tell us about the sulfur in fuels. You could take it out before, during or after. Three points. Ooh, that was an easy three points. So what do they do in pre-combustion? Well, they remove the sulfur. <laughs> but how the hell do they do that? I'm trying to remember. Do they wash it out? Something like that. Oh, I can't remember. But I know in post-combustion, what you can do is you can... Uh, you can spray chalky water into the, into the post-combustion exhaust gases and that will dissolve, uh, that will react with the sulfuric acid that would be formed. So post-combustion, I think that's right. Neutralisation with a base, yes, that's it. So you neutralise it with a, neutralise with a base. I chose chalk. What's the other one? Remove the sulfur. <laughs> I got it. Oh man, it's a tricky question to ask. Any question on that that isn't just remove it. Okay, next one. Uh, this seems very reasonable so far. I think there's going to be some kicking the teeth coming later. The orgo. Let's see what they're going to do with the orgo. Fox gene. That's a nerve gas. What are you making that? What are you telling me how to make nerve gas for? Oh. It's quite easy. So the equilibrium constant, actually in a good mood at how well I'm doing on this paper. Again, I'm going to ignore the state symbols. So concentration of the products at equilibrium divided by the concentration of reactants. I see they're all gases, so they're going to ask me about the pressure. da -de da but that's coming up. Okay, these questions always look a little bit daunting, but... There's a couple of little tricks you've got to fix with the units, but that's okay. So looking at the correct section of the data booklet, it's this delta G equation that you're going to need. You have the sufficient data for that. So delta G theta equals minus Richard Thornley ln K. And that K is the equilibrium constant, so I'm going to call it KC. So R is 8.31, but I'm in joules for my 8.31 where is it there it is so i got to remember to fix that up at the end because the question wants kilojoules I can do that the temperature well that's going to be 273 plus 600 because we need kelvin multiplied by the natural log of 0 0.200 which was given in the question so minus 8.31 multiplied by 873, multiplied by the natural log of 0.2. All right, and so that's with the joules, and I want kilojoules, so I'm going to divide by 1,000 in my head, so that's going to be 11.68, 11 uh, 11 11.68, 11.68, and uh, no, I think we need three sig figs, don't we? I see three sig figs all the way through. So that's going to be 11.7, and that's kilojoules. Is that right? Yep. Next one. This is uh, basically an SL idea where you take the, the heats of formation and you do products minus reactants. Let me just grab the equation. A 
Let's put our numbers in, carbon monoxide, looking at the data table is minus 110.5. Chlorine, uh, every element in its standard state has a heat formation of zero and the uh, phosgene was given the question. So that's minus 220, <coughs> excuse me, 0.1. And then all you're gonna do is products minus reactants. So delta H for the whole thing is going to be the sum of the heat of formation of the products minus the sum change in heat of formation of the reactants. So that's going to be uh, minus 220.1 minus minus 110.5. Oh, there's no minus. Oh, there is minus. Minus 220.1 plus 110.5. So that's going to give me uh, minus 109.6. Yep, decimal place one, decimal place one all the way. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. No points for the units because they gave it to you in the question. All right, the next question, uh, yeah, building up to this delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, aren't they? We're getting there. So this is the uh, this is the payoff. So we've got delta G theta equals delta H minus T delta S. And they want the delta S. Okay, so you, everything else has got to be there, isn't it? Delta G, we calculated that just up above. That's uh, minus... What was that? 11.7. So delta G is going to be 11.7. Delta H, I just did that, minus 109.6. Temperature, well, it's standard temperature. So that's going to be 298 Kelvin, 25 degrees C. And uh, delta S is the unknown. So let's just solve for delta S. Are there tricks? Yes, there's a trick. Uh, the delta S is going to come out in kilojoules because everything else has kilojoules and they want it in, I bet they want it in joules. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can do that. So delta S is going to be 11.7 plus 109.6 divided by minus 298. 298. So I can't put the minus in, so the answer is going to be minus uh, 407. So delta S is going to be minus 407 uh, joules, uh, and it's actually joules per Kelvin. Is that right? <laughs> nice. Next one. Polyurethane, la la la. X is a primary, secondary, or tertiary amine. Hmm. Well, I can see that on the nitrogens, there's only one kind of R group, and that means it's going to be a primary amine. If there was another R group, now an alkyl group, or a phenyl group, or methyl, ethyl, propyl, then it would have been a secondary. And if it had another R group on, and these could all be different, of course, it would be a tertiary. But as it stands, that's a primary. Don't need to explain why. Okay, this is a, a little bit of an obscure corner here, but it, I think your best guess might be right. It seems that you're adding hydrogen because look, the, the no two's gone to no two. So you're adding hydrogen. And if you want to get hydrogen to stick on, you know what, nickel, platinum, or palladium, those are the catalysts that will work. So you could hydrogenate like that. So that's your two points. So those two strong acids reacting together, well, uh, one's going to give away an H plus to the other, isn't it? Even though that feels a bit strange. Uh, in fact, the sulfuric acid is going to donate an H plus to the nitric acid. So that's going to make HSO4 minus and H2NO3 plus. Now, the IB will give you that, but uh, it's actually nicer. I think if you then show that the water 
drops off of that peculiar nitric acid to make the NO2+, because that's ultimately what you need. So there's your points there. Is that two points? Just one point. Although like, although, like I say, they'd accept just a top equation. So this is, uh, you just have to sit and learn it, you know. I teach it on day N, and I forget it on day N plus one. Uh, but they, this has come up, I say, one every, once every three or four years. So that's the nitronium ion. So here are the steps. Uh, so this is positive, and it's obviously going to be attracted to the electrons in the, uh, in the ring there. So the electrons in the ring are going to come over. And then what you're going to get now is, well, the ring electrons are going to be compromised. And you show that by putting a dotty line. And then you've now attached that nitronium ions become an NO2. Now, secretly hidden on that also was this hydrogen atom. Now, of course, there were six of them there, but I'm just looking at that one. And so for the next step, you have to show the curly arrows moving from the bond that's from the carbon to the hydrogen back into that ring to restore the ring. So once you've restored the ring, you've stuck on that NO2. And don't forget that little H+. Plus. I've forgotten something along the way. Can you see what it is? <clears throat> Deliberately. Yep. This is a plus here. This part of the equation is plus, so this part of the equation also has to be plus. So don't forget that plus in the middle. They'll dock your point for that as well. Now, what's the name of that? Oh, okay, so it's going to be ethan, isn't it? It's two carbons. Uh, it's an ol because it's alcohol. You know what? It's a diol because I can clearly see two alcohol groups. But you've got to tell me where those alcohol groups are. So it's 1, 2, ethan diol. And the class, oh, that's going to be alcohol, isn't it? They're not going to mess me around with that. Alcohol, yeah. How many signals on an H1 NMR compound? I do like the old H1 NMR. In fact, I slipped and banged my head in Turkey. And they stuck me in one. I had amnesia, so I don't remember. I just believe people that told me the story. Okay, so it looks like I've got... There's one hydrogen environment from the OH. And then there's a second hydrogen environment from those. So I think there's going to be two peaks, two signals giving my reasons. So I think there's going to be two peaks because there's two hydrogen environments. Is that enough? Two peaks due to two hydrogen environments. Two and two hydrogen environments in a molecule. Nice. Next up, the mass spectrum. <coughs> hmm. I'm just having a little look there. 15, that's probably going to be CH3. I still think it should be plus because it's only the positive ions that make it through. 29, hmm. that could be ethyl, couldn't it? This the other weird aldehyde one that could be 29, isn't it? CHO, 16, 17, 27, yeah. Mm, okay, so what's the question? Identify the species causing the large peak at 31 in the mass spectrum. So for mass spectrometry uh, in IB, you're allowed only one cut and kind of by mutual agreement at the IB, you can't just cut off a hydrogen. So I'm going to cut, make one cut, and let's see what the mass of what's left. It should be 31. Uh, if you can't cut off a hydrogen, well, really, is it there? So I've got 12 and 12 is 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. No, it's not there. So maybe it's in the middle to get 31. Cut there. I've got 12, 13, 14, 15, 25, 31. That's it. So the fragment is going to be this. 
And remember, it has to be positive to go through the machine. If it's neutral, it won't go through. So identify the species causing the large peak in the mass spectrum. So I think it was the uh, was this one here. I'm hoping that they say plus because they're not always consistent with that. Except if it's plus, it is plus. Okay. And what is Q using section twenty? Uh, 26, so Q's at 3,200. So 3,200. Oh, so that's going to be the OH bond. Don't forget, infrared tells you about bond. Is it the OH bond, the CH bond? What bond is it? So I think it's going to be the OH bond of the alcohol. Oxygen, hydrogen. Nice. Phenylamine. Phenylamine can act as a weak base. Calculate the pH. Oh. Bit of an abrupt uh, turn there. Okay, so what does phenylamine look like? So it's a benzene ring with kind of an ammonia jammed on. So let me do the... Uh, let me draw that out. Phenylamine. And if it's a base, when it reacts with water, weak base, equilibrium, it's going to make OH minus. So how could I do that? Well, if I was to take that an H plus and pop it onto there, that would probably do that, wouldn't it? So plus, I've got this chemical here. It's NH3 plus now. So I've got KB because it's a base. It's going to be uh, the concentration of kind of that monster multiplied by OH minus divided by the reactants, which was kind of that with the NH2. Are they asking me for my assumptions? What about next question? No. Oh, but if they were, the assumption would be, they often ask this, is it really should be minus OH minus here? And you're allowed to ignore that if the OH minus is small. No. If the OH minus is small relative to the concentration of phenylamine, then you can ignore it. But they haven't asked that classic question. So KB. Well, I don't know what KB is. They did give me... PKB, which is 9 to the 9.13. So I know that 10 to the minus 9.13 equals, well, I also know that this and that had the same concentration. So I can assume that is OH squared, OH minus squared. Well, how can I assume that? Well, if you go up to the stoichiometric uh, the ratio at the top here, I've got, uh, one of those needs one of those. So it's fair enough to say that they're identical. And at the bottom of the equation is the concentration of the uh, that it says on the bottle. So that's 0 0.01. All right, let's try this uh, flashy new calculator. So that's the concentration of the hydroxide ions, 2.723, 2.723 times 10 to the minus 6 uh, moles per decimeters cubed. Now from there, I've got a couple of roots, but I'm going to work out the pH, excuse me, I'm going to work out the pOH and then the pH, I think. So using the equation uh, pOH equals the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration. So 
So the POH is 5.565. So the POH is 5.565. And knowing that uh, POH plus PH equals 14. So pH is going to be 14 minus pOH, which is 14 minus 5.565. So the pH is going to be 8.438. And looking at the sig figs, pretty sure that's three sig figs there. So I'm going to knock that off. 8.44, that's the right answer.